Good morning. What a joy it is to be with you this morning as we spend some time worshiping the Lord and uh, trying to do our best to bring glory to Him. What I like to do in, uh, in gospel meetings, and it's what I've tried to do this week, I've I got really three things in, in mind. I, I, I want to glorify God, and I, I want to edify His people, and I want to say some things that if you are not enjoying salvation in Christ, that it may uh, prompt you to uh, turn your life around by allowing the Lord uh, into your life. And so that's, that's what I hope to be able to do. In this Bible class period this morning, as I announced last evening, I, I, I want to talk to you about how I came to know the Lord. And it, it, here's the thing about it. You know, you look in the book of Acts and you, you, you see the conversion, let's say, of Saul of Tarsus. And, you know, God has used 28 chapters in the book of Acts to reveal to us the development and the spread of, early, uh, of the early church. And three of those chapters are actually devoted to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus because his story of conversion is so impactful. Uh, we read about it initially in chapter 9, again in chapter 22 uh, when he's confronting a Jewish mob, and then in chapter 26 when he's uh, defending himself against uh, uh, Pilate, or, I mean uh, against uh, Agrippa. And, and when we think about conversions and we think about how people came to the Lord, everybody, including all of you this morning, everybody has a unique story of conversion. And I look out at you and I, I, I probably see a number of people who had the privilege of being raised by Christian parents who loved the Lord and who loved you. And at a very early age, you were introduced to the Lord. You were introduced to the truth of God's Word. And as a result of that, as a result of the good parenting that you had, you were raised to, uh, uh, to know the Lord and you, and you became a Christian in that way. And while all of us have unique stories, all of us have stories of our conversion, they're different. And my story is different than that. I wasn't raised by Christian parents. And how I became a Christian, uh, I believe, is, is, is something that we could consider that may be able to help us in, uh, in maybe reaching somebody else who was raised perhaps like, like I was. My story really uh, was a story of leaving the Nazarene denomination. And so I could just really talk about my story as why I left the Nazarene church. Now, in order to really make this applicable, there are two things I really need to do at the outset of this. I could, now this is not the way that I'm going to approach this. I, I could say, well, the Nazarene church teaches this, the Church of Christ teaches that. Nazarene church believes this, church... I'm not going in that direction, although that could be a very profitable way to deal with this. But what I want to do is, is to begin by familiarizing you with the Church of the Nazarene. It traces its beginning back to about 1908. The Church of the Nazarene began as a unity movement, uh, uniting the holiness movement that was... Uh, uh, pretty pronounced at that particular time. The Nazarene denomination was founded directly upon the teaching of John and Charles Wesley. Uh, it, was not, it is not Calvinistic in its, its approach, but there's some Calvinistic tendencies that it might have. Wesley believed that justification came by grace solely through one's faith. And he also taught, and the Nazarene church taught and believed that the Christian needed after salvation to receive entire sanctification. These were two separate things, salvation and then sanctification. Salvation removed your sins. Sanctification removed the atomic nature that we were supposedly born with, the propensity to, to sin. And these two separate actions were, you know, were, were the result of God working upon the sinner uh, and two separate distinct experiences. And so when you talk to someone, in, like we were in the Nazarene church, uh, they'll talk to you about the first and second works of grace. first work of grace is salvation. The second work of grace is entire sanctification. Now, the holiness movement really began in the 1830s, and it was to promote the doctrine of just what we, we, we particularly talked about here. 
But by 1900, this holiness movement had splintered, had divided into several different denominational churches. And what they then did is have this unity movement and they got together and they decided upon, after uniting, to refer to themselves as the Church of the Nazarene. Again, promoting the doctrines of John and Charles Wesley. Now, what we need to also do now, after having just a cursory understanding of the Nazarene denomination, I need to talk to you a little bit about my early life. Yeah, that's me. Uh, it's not something I want you to put on Facebook, but that's me. Uh, uh, my, my life, my early life was lived without God. And I'll just tell you that right now. I, I wasn't raised going to church. I wasn't raised believing in God. And God was often not even in my peripheral. I, I really wasn't thinking about God at, at all in my, in, in my early life. Uh, I came from a home that was broken both by divorce and by religion. My, my dad was uh, a non-practicing Catholic. My mother was a nothing, uh, spiritually or religiously at, at all. And I have to tell you, as a result of that, religion did not impress me at all. I was not influenced by Catholicism. I was not influenced by Protestantism. None of this influenced me at all. My life was lived in rebellion uh, to what we recognize that Christians ought, ought to live. I lived a very worldly life. I participated in things of the world, uh, clubs and dancing and so forth and so on was just part of the upbringing I can remember very early on. Uh, that some of the early things that I would do in life was go to the KFC dances, the Knights of Columbus dances there uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, where I was raised. And I often tasted the bitter fruit of sin. That was just part of my upbringing. Several of my aunts and uncles owned and operated beer joints, liquor stores, and were heavily involved in the liquor industry. I don't say this out of a sense of pride. I say this out of shame. This is something that I was immersed in very early in my life. I, I can remember when my dad, when he was doing some part-time work, uh, he did it for a cousin of his that owned a beer joint in Louisville, South Louisville, and I would go up with dad when he was bartending, and I would help him bring the beer out from the back uh, in, into, into, into the front. This, this was my life. And uh, maybe, maybe I attended church services, whether we're talking about Catholicism or Protestantism, maybe five or six times in my upbringing. And that was before I, I, I went, into, it went into the army. So that's my upbringing. Well, somebody said, well, Jay, I thought you left the Nazarene church. Well, stay with me. Because what happened was when I married... I married a girl who was raised in the Nazarene church. She, was, she lived a religious life. And her grandfather, Clarence Elam, had preached for the Nazarene church. He was a Nazarene preacher, and he had preached in the Nazarene church for uh, maybe 50 or, or so years. As a matter of fact, Sue's mother was the pianist and the organist where her grandfather preached. And later on... Sue's mother formed a gospel group, a gospel trio comprised of Sue's brother and Sue's sister and another singer. And so that's the, that, that, that was the conflict, you know. When we married, it was your proverbial bad boy, good girl uh, marriage. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, she was raised going to church all the time, and, and, and church was just something that I, it was not even on my, on my radar a, at all. After, and by the way, when we got married, it was something her parents did not want. Uh, they didn't want this marriage to come off because, because of the diverse backgrounds. Uh, as a matter of fact, they, they wouldn't even attend our wedding. Uh, and so I, that's, that's another story that I, that I won't get into. After our marriage... Sue left her religious 
moorings. And she began to participate in my lifestyle. And that was something that was bearing heavily on her conscience. She stopped attending church. She started doing what I was normally doing as far as my upbringing was concerned. And, and, and I'll tell you something about this. It's, it's just confirms what the proverb writer says in chapter 12 and verse 26, that, that the wicked leads the righteous astray. And that's what was happening in our relationship. Uh, so she had left her religious moorings, but I'll tell you what, it was, it was something that was crushing her conscience. And so what she decided to do was to return to her religious roots. And her grandfather had retired preaching by this time. And he was attending uh, a large, a large Nazarene denomination on 18th Street in Louisville, Kentucky, known as the First Church of the Nazarene. So his entire family was there uh, at, at the time. And so when, when I say that Sue returned to her religious roots, she started attending that Nazarene denomination that her, her folks uh, had attended. I, I remember what she said to me one time. She said, I can't live this way anymore. She's talking about the lifestyle that I had been living. And she said, I can't live this way anymore. I'm, I, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to church. And she had in mind the Nazarene denomination. And she said, you, you can do what you want to do, but I'm going to church. That was her turn. And she did. And off she went, and I stayed home. And she'd go to church, and, and she'd always ask me to go, and she stopped doing the things that I wanted us to be doing, and she said, I can't do that anymore. And so this went on and on and on. So finally I decided, you know, I, I better go see what's going on. And so I started attending with her. And when I first started going to this denomination, i got to tell you people, I, I was skeptical. I was unimpressed. I, I, it was not something that I understood. It, I, I became skeptical. It was in, totally foreign to me. But I tell you, one of the things that captivated me, it was the kindness these people showed to me. They didn't look at me as somebody that was a scumbag, that what are you doing here kind of thing. They, they seemed to have taken an interest in me, and they really took an interest in this young couple, Sue and, and, and her heathen husband. And so... After a while, I began to be more comfortable with what I referred to as church people. And as a result of that, I would attend with Sue on a regular basis. Now, I want you to understand something. All the Bible and all the scripture that I heard was from the Nazarene pulpit in the Sunday school classes and the revivals that they would have. And I began to hear that we're sinners separated from God. I was hearing this in the Nazarene church. I, I was hearing about, uh, about heaven and hearing about hell and hearing about the love of Christ, hearing about the life of holiness and all of these things I was hearing. And I'm hearing about the blood of Christ and, and the forgiveness of sins. And, and this began to creep into my being. And I got concerned about my soul for the first time in my life. I had been in the military. I did not go, but I was thought that I would be, be going to Vietnam during the late 1960s. And even at that, even the thoughts of being in Saigon, being in, in Vietnam, in war, I didn't think about my soul. I didn't think about salvation. I didn't think about eternity. But now, sitting in this Nazarene church building, I, 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 I begin to think about these things, and, and I begin to be concerned about these things, and it began to trouble me. And so I wanted to do something about that. And the only thing that I knew to do about that was what I was taught in that Nazarene church. And so one Sunday evening, we were there at service at church services, and I answered what was called an altar call. Now, let me tell you about an altar. An altar in the Nazarene church was a structure 
that was down in front of the pulpit that went all the way across, got a half moon kind of thing. And it was situated in a way that you could come up and it, you, you could kneel down. It had a place for your knees and you could put your arms up on the altar, much like these folks are doing here. And you would pray and you were told to pray through. And the idea was that you began to ask God to forgive you and Jesus to come into your heart. And as long as you were holding back something, you were not getting through. And so you begin to evaluate your life and you begin to evaluate what it is that you're trying to hold on to. And so I went to the altar that night in order to find salvation. What happened was very interesting because when I went to the altar and I knelt down and began to pray, next thing that I remembered is that Sue had come up with me and she had put her arm in mine and I could hear her praying for me. And then the preacher on the other side of the altar knelt down, laid his hand on me, and he began to pray for me. And half that congregation had gotten up and come to the altar with me to pray and help me pray through. I received an experience that night. I felt as though the world had been lifted off of me and I had felt, I felt free and I felt content for the first time in my life insofar as a relationship with God was concerned. I felt that I had prayed through and that Jesus had entered into my life and I felt saved. I changed friends. I changed the way that I lived. I began to give testimonies both at church and at work about what God had done in, in my life. There was a fellow living next door to us at the time that was a member of a motorcycle outlaw gang. And I felt that God had laid it on my heart to go talk to this man about his soul. And I went over there and I did just that. And I can remember he and I getting down on our knees in his living room. And he doing what I felt that I had done at that altar call. This is how serious that we were in our work in that Nazarene church. When, I be, we be, when did all of this happened, Sue and I then became very active. We, we were choir members. I became a Sunday school teacher. We were involved in what was called a bus ministry at the time, bringing people to to services. We were very active in the Nazarene Young People Society that today is known as the uh, Nazarene Youth International. But we were very involved in that. And furthermore, I got involved in, in, in trying to help the young people. I became really what you might refer to as a, youth, as a lay youth director. I organized all the sporting activities and all the things for the young people to do. And I bring that up just to say that this was something that we were serious about. We were not playing church. We wanted to do what we believed God wanted us to do. And one of the things that we were not doing at the time that we covenanted together to do, and that is we decided that we need to have a serious, serious home Bible study. So Sue and I began a daily Bible reading schedule. And I'm talking about just she and I would do this. We, 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 we decided we're going to read through the Gospels and we're going to read through the book of Acts. We had no earthly idea really of the continuity of the Bible, but we began there. And I can remember this. Every time after we would, we would read, uh, we would both get down on our knees in the living room and we would have prayer. And this was something that we were doing on a regular basis. But what was happening, what was happening during this time is we noticed some things that we had not noticed before. And one of the things that I noticed off, really right off the bat was that the Bible had a lot to say about baptism especially when we got into the book of Acts. 
we were, you know, and, and I, this, this began to really set into my heart and my mind. Whoa, whoa, what, what, what's going on here? And like I say on the screen, this, this kind of really became an, an, an uh-oh mo a moment for me. Uh-oh, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I, you know, I'm working with the young people. I'm singing in the choir. I'm part of the bus ministry. But you know what? Old Jr.'s never been baptized, and I, that that began to concern me, and so I began to question about that. I I, I went to the to what we called our pastor, and and I said, you know, I I, I need to be baptized. I believe I I, I want to be baptized, and he said, why? And you know my answer was? I'll tell you just how shallow I was. My answer was, well, uh, and I'm referring to Acts 2. I said, well, well Peter said so. <laughs> that, was, that was good enough for me. I mean, if Peter said I, I needed to be baptized, that was the depth of my understanding. Well, then they asked me another question. They said, well, how do you want to be baptized? I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you, you know, we, we can do it in one of three modes. We can sprinkle water on you. We can pour water on your head or we can immerse you. And I said, well, I think, I think I'm, I'm going to opt for immersion. And so they had to fill the baptistry up. I mean, they had a baptistry there, but it was empty. And so they, they, they filled the baptistry up and preparations then were made. Some others asked to be baptized as well. So they decided to have a baptismal service there at the Nazarene Church, and it was scheduled for a Sunday evening, but it was about three weeks out from the time that I had requested uh, to, be, to be baptized. And one of the things that I didn't realize, I, I didn't realize, even though I, I, I said I want to be baptized because Peter said so, I didn't realize at this time the essentiality of baptism. Uh, that, that hadn't struck me yet. I, I didn't realize, I knew it was important, but I did not realize how important it was because I felt that I was saved. I felt that I was saved the time that I went to the altar during the altar call. So we scheduled a baptismal service and they believe that baptism is an outward response to an inward reality. Uh, that is, you're already, you're already saved that after your salvation, your next step would be baptism to identify that you have been saved. Well, one of the things that interested me is, is when I got to the eighth chapter of the book of Acts in our reading, I noticed what we mentioned last evening that the Ethiopian, when he requested baptism, and that's what I was doing, that he was told to, if he believed, he could, and he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so I, that's what I wanted to say. And when we got into the water, I expected to be able to say, like the Ethiopian, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That didn't happen. As a matter of fact, the preacher was reading from the church manual, and he looked at me and he said, Now, believing that God has given you forgiveness of sins and a spiritual life, and then he goes on to say some other things, and then I was told what to say. I was told to say, All this I believe. And that's what I said. Because I'm standing in the water, ready to be immersed. And that was thrown upon me, and that's what I confessed. It didn't turn out the way that I thought that it was going to turn out. And the more study that Sue and I did, the more we saw that the things that we were teach, being taught were not consistent with the Word of God. So many times I went over to the preacher's house and I would bring questions to him. I'd want to know, okay, you said this. And, and, and the Bible says that, well, we, can you kind of help me understand uh, what's going on? Because I, I'm confused. And I wasn't trying to stir up trouble. I was trying to understand. For instance, our, bab, our manual, our church manual, which I have pictured here. Our church manual said baptism is a sacrament showing one's intention to follow God. 
But when you look at the Bible, you see the Bible says it's a command. Peter commanded Cornelius and his household to be baptized. And baptism is to remit sins. And, and the Bible says that baptism puts one into Christ. That's not what we were being taught. And I would question the preacher about that. And, you know, very often uh, it, it's, it's, like, it's like a preacher that I asked who was holding a crusade in, in Louisville one time. And it's just a, just a citywide crusade, sort of like a, a Billy Graham crusade. It wasn't Billy Graham, but it was along those lines. And I asked, I asked that preacher about baptism. I said, it seems to me when I read the New Testament that baptism is necessary. I'd reach that point now. And he said, no, young man, let me tell you something. Baptism is not necessary to salvation. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, the earth was two-thirds water before Jesus ever shed a drop of his blood. If baptism was necessary for salvation, then Jesus died in vain. Those are the kind of answers that I was being given to the questions that I, I, I would have. Church of the Nazarene had women clergy, women evangelists who would hold revival services. And I can remember when we were scheduling a revival, we had a woman evangelist, Nettie Miller, coming in to do the preaching. And I had already read what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. I had it underlined in my Bible. And I went to the preacher and I asked him, about, how can we do this? So these are the things that begin to trouble us. And trouble us, they did. Both of us became concerned with these things. Now, I could have included a number of other issues that we had. There were always problems pertaining to who gets to play on the ball teams and uh, who's going to use the fellowship hall and who's going to sing in the choir. And, uh, you know, what, what quartets are we going to have to come in? And, and as a matter of fact, we had... At that Nazarene church, we would have, this is before they went country, we would have the Oak Ridge boys coming in and performing on Sunday morning, giving altar calls. People would flock uh, to the altar. As a matter of fact, and you can talk to Sue about this, uh, she named our son after one of the Oak Ridge boys. So that's, you, I mean, I mean just, <laughs> that's, that's what that is, you know. But anyway, we, we had all of these, these, these things that were going on. And then, you know, I could talk about how that the Nazarene Church headquarters in Lenexa, Kansas, or Kansas City, uh, Kansas. And so, you know, all of these things could be brought up. And all of these things were, were issues at this particular time. And, and we didn't know what to do. We had no idea how to respond to this. Uh, and, and we would lie awake at night reading our Bible and trying to understand what to do. And very often, you know, I would see people at the Nazarene church that were, in, in, you know, they had peace and they had contentment and they were seeking entire sanctification and some were saying that they were entirely sanctified. The old Adam nature, the propensity to sin had been removed. I don't know how many hours I spent on my knees praying that God would sanctify me wholly. And it wasn't happening. And I would lie there and I, what, what, what in the world is wrong? with me? Well, why is God rejecting me? And, and, and these kinds of things. And I, I can remember I, I can remember one time when, when Sue and I were going to a zone meeting. Let me, let me tell you about that. The Nazarene denomination as a whole headquartered in, Missouri, headquartered in Kansas City. Uh, and, and then you would have diff, districts and we'd have district superintendents and within those districts, you would have zones that were made up of three or four different Nazarene churches. And so we were having a zone meeting one time. And our district superintendent was going to be speaking. And so Sue and I, representing the First Church of the Nazarene, with some others, we went to this. And it was held at the Trinity Nazarene Church on Cane Run Road in, in Louisville. And, and so we were sitting there on the front row, actually. And the district superintendent was up preaching and he was talking about this peace that people have as a result of being Christians. And I can remember him saying that, you know, his wife, uh, she was talking to a neighbor and the neighbor asked her, said, how is it that you have such peace? And how is it you just display such contentment? How do you do that? 
And I, I remember leaning over to Sue and I said, watch him now. He, he's going to say, because the Bible says this, or the Bible says, that's what I said. And, and, and he said, well, now my wife told her uh, that you need to read this book. And he reaches down and he pulls out a book that he wrote. <laughs> and he said, and by the way, these are available for sale out in the foyer. <laughs> and Sue and I looked at each other. We got up and walked out. And we decided something's got to change. Something's got to change in our lives. But ha what's going to happen? What, 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 ha where are we going? I really believe at this time that Sue and I were like Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5 and verse 6. We were hungry and thirsty after righteousness. We, we, needed, we, we needed to make a change, but we didn't know what to do. We, we didn't know where to go. I now recognized that despite what happened at the altar, I was not saved. I knew that. I knew that I did not have a relationship with God. I, I even reached the point that can we even really know that we have a relationship with God? I was on a journey. Sue and I both were on a journey at this time. Our whole world had been uprooted, and we didn't know what to do. We decided that we were going to visit various denominational churches, and we were going to measure what we were hearing with the Bible. And so we attended Methodist churches, Baptist churches, Assemblies of God. We attended the Church of God, and, and, and we, we would go through all, all, all of these churches, and we'd you know, we were finding, you know, some things that we would agree with and some things that we recognized were, were, were not in the Scriptures. Our preacher and others at church knew of our concerns. And they worked with us. They tried to help us with our concerns. But what they did is they thought it was best just to warn us. Now, when you're visiting around, you, you, there's some people you need to avoid. And you want to avoid the Mormon church. And you want to avoid Mormonism, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you want to avoid the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they said, you want to stay away from the Church of Christ. And so we were in a dilemma. We took those warnings seriously. We were not going to be involved with the Mormons. We were not going to visit a kingdom hall. And we're not going to visit Church of Christ. Just simply because of the warnings that we had been given. Somebody told us at this time, and you can call it Providence if you like. I like to refer to it that way. Somebody told us about a radio program that was being conducted on a religious radio station in Louisville, Kentucky, on AM dial. And they told about it was a call-in program, and you could call in and ask these preachers questions, and sometimes you'd hear a lot of argumentation, but sometimes you'd get some pretty good answers. So somebody said, you, you might be interested in, in, in listening to that. And so we did just that. We listened to what was called the What is Written radio broadcast. It was sponsored by the South End Church of Christ, on Taylor Boulevard in Louisville, Kentucky. And the preacher was a young man by the name of Kenneth Green. And he would host this program, and he would have a guest preacher with him, and you could call in and begin to ask questions. And they would answer those questions from the Bible. And I began to do that. I took the same questions that I had for my preacher, and I would call into this radio program, and let me tell you something, I was getting a whole world different answers there. And this was something that was intriguing to me. I had no idea what a concordance was, but I made my own concordance. I had a little three-by-five cards. One was labeled baptism. One was labeled salvation. One was labeled the church and all of these things. And I had just my own little concordance. And when I listened to this radio program, man, it was helping me fill up my, my, my concordance. It sounded like truth, 
It sounded like these people were wanting to obey the truth. But I've been warned. <laughs> I've been warned about those people. You, 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 you kind of need to stay away from those people. And so we did for a long time avoid it. But then we decided one, I guess Friday or Saturday, we decided on that coming Sunday, or pretty soon we were going to, to visit the Church of Christ. And so we didn't go that Sunday. Went, to, went, 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 went back to the Nazarene Church on Wednesday night during our, what we called prayer meeting, but really just a testimony. Everybody was giving their testimonies. And so that Wednesday night, I can remember going to the choir director, personal friend. And I said, Paul, I said, uh, Sue and I won't be here Sunday. We're going to be visiting again. He said, oh, where are you going? Yeah. I didn't want to tell him. <laughs> we decided to visit church. I, I didn't want to tell him because, you know, it, what we'd been warned. I said, well, we just, we, we just, we're just going to visit around. He said, well, where are you going? I said, well, now what I'm about to tell you, you think is embellished or hyperbole. It is not. I, 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 I told him, I, I said, well, Paul, I said, we're going to visit the Church of Christ. I promise you. He looked me in the eye and he said to me, he said, I wish you wouldn't do that. I said, why? He said, because if you do, you will not come back here. I said, oh, no, we've, we've visited a lot of churches. We'll be back. We visited the Church of Christ, and he was right. We never went back to the Nazarene Church. We made a visit that absolutely changed our life. For the first time, we entered a Church of Christ building. And the people were extremely nice and friendly to us. And what was interesting is that the preacher, Brother Green, was preaching a series on the errors of premillennialism. And I can remember the first sermon that I heard him preach. And he was talking about the fulfillment of the land promise that God had made to Abraham. Now you may think, well, that's not something you would have needed, is it? coming from the Nazarene church, you needed more first principle lesson. I needed that lesson because I was premillennial. I never heard that word used in my life. But I believed that the Jews were going to go back to Palestine and I believed Jesus was going to return and reign in Jerusalem on David's literal throne for a thousand years. I believed that even though I'd never heard the word premillennial before. And I can remember after the sermon. I leaned over to Sue, and I said, Honey, could, could we be wrong about this too? And then after services, we went out into the foyer, and I met Ken Green for the first time. I introduced myself, and I said, This is my wife. <laughs> and I said something really stupid. I said, uh, We're members of the First Church of the Nazarene. Do you know where that is? <laughs> He said, yeah, I know where it is. And I said, well, you know, I've got a lot of questions that I like to ask. Would it be possible for somebody from this church to come and talk to us? And I, I, I tell people, now this is an embellishment. I tell people, well, he was waiting on me when I got home. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, but we did set up a Bible study, and we, we began to have a home Bible study. And it, about two weeks later, June 19, 1972, Sue and I obeyed the Lord. And we're baptized scripturally for the remission of our sins. Our journey was long. It was winding. And I have been preaching the gospel of Christ since 1975. Now, some things about this that I, I need to kind of emphasize here. The experience that I had the night that I went to the altar, that was real. Nobody can look me in the eye and say, J.R., you were de deluded. You didn't have that experience. I did. But the truth of the matter is, that experience did not save me. The experience was real. And I was led to believe that the experience would save. But it didn't. Forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. 
not in the feelings of the sinner. You obey from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered. Being then made free, Paul says, in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. This is how you're made free. And, and, and another thing uh, uh, about that. We left all of our friends. Every social relationship that we had was anchored in that Nazarene church. We left every social relationship that we had. We left family to become Christians. But I've got to tell you, Jesus said, if you love father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. It wasn't that we didn't love our folks. It wasn't that we didn't love our friends, but we loved the Lord more than anyone or anything else. As a result of that decision, all three of our children became Christians. Their spouses are Christians. All 11 of our grandchildren have obeyed the gospel. And the ones who are married, their spouses have obeyed the gospel. My mother became a Christian. My two sisters became Christians. After 35 years, Sue's mother and daddy became Christians. So what appears to be a lack of love is really the essence of love. If we had walked away from what we knew and what we'd learned, then all of those who have since become Christians in all probability would not be Christians. And so you may have a legitimate question. J.R., you've spent a Bible study period of time talking about why you left the Nazarene church. So let me tell you why this study, I believe, is important. And the reason is there's so many people in the wilderness of sin, like I was, having no clue where to go, no clue where to turn to, that needs somebody like you to reach out to them and say, let me share with you the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's why I take time to speak on this subject. You find these people and you teach these people and you be direct with these people and don't water down the gospel. Tell them what they need. That's what people did to us. And I'm so thankful to God that they did. So I hope you enjoyed the study. Thank you very much.